Hello, welcome to another episode of Movies on Movies as part of Asian Cinema Season 2017 and this is The Making of Tan Popo from 1986. I'm not sure if the director of Tan Popo, uh, Juzo Itami, made this documentary but he certainly is all over it. He narrates the entire thing. It's a 90 minute documentary and it's kind of credited at the beginning as being the director's video diary, the director's diary of the making of Tan Popo and I didn't know what to expect with this. I figured behind the scenes footage, interviews with the actors, and it turned out to be maybe the best film I've ever seen about making a film. I mean, there are those great kind of in-depth documentaries on films like Blade Runner or the Lord of the Rings documentaries that are just so unbelievably extensive. Uh, and there are other great ones too, but this one, just about making a film from the filmmaker's perspective, it was it was just such a delight. As someone who likes to make films, it was just so interesting because this basically almost presents you with the entire film uh, in special feature format. It's like a video commentary of the whole film in a lot of ways. I mean, it's an hour and a half, the film's almost two hours. We get a little bit at the beginning about the pre-production, the director's idea of making a film about food and ramen and doing something different and uh, in, you know instilling it with comedy and the ideals of uh, westerns, like literal kind of you know cowboy westerns. And the pre-production process again, like how just down to the, the lead character, Tam Popo, her clothes, there's footage of them trying on different outfits and stuff, and they're just meticulously going through all these clothes, and he's like, hmm, it's, it's, uh, it's not sexy enough, but it, it can't be too sexy. It needs to have some element that she's attractive, but she still has to be more closed off, or maybe take the button down there, and it really shows you how, like, how in-depth you have to go to make a film, or some people do, if they really put the time in. And that's something that I think so many making of documentaries really skirt over. And I suppose rightfully so, because there's only so much time you can dedicate to these things. But most making ofs that you see of films, especially like modern ones, are just like, oh, it was so great working with this director. Oh, it was so great, you know, da 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 da. Oh, with the special effects here, then da 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 da. You never really get the sense that, I mean, with the Lord of the Rings ones, I think, that you really get into all those little details to like the nth degree. Like even the bowls that they used for the food, like they would inspect them and have think people sent out and kind of see is this right for that and there's a scene where these um, businessmen go out for, for food in one of the vignettes in the film and two of the, the businessmen are meant to look kind of really embarrassed and red faced so they did all these different screen tests with different shades of red makeup and how it would look in real life but how it would look on film and doing screen tests how they would film loads of different bowls of ramen with different consistencies different strengths of the broth you know different mixes to see what looks best on film all this attention to detail in the, the preparation of making it and then once the film starts you literally get kind of a chronological view of every single key scene in the movie from behind the scenes. It seems like they had a behind the scenes camera there for everything. So almost every memorable moment you can think of in the film, you'll see it from slightly to the left or the right with the, the behind the scenes camera. And it kind of shocked me at times how close the behind the scenes camera was able to get. You know, you're looking at the film and there's someone literally just off the edge of the frame filming it for the behind the scenes documentary. And so you see the before and the after of these takes, you see them laughing and cracking up and you see the lead actress kind of getting nervous about, you know, getting her lines right and being directed by her husband at the time. And, um, you know, him kind of saying, no, do it like this, no, do it like that. And, and you really get the sense of what a director he is from that onset footage and he talks about... Uh, his his approach to making films and again he narrates everything and there's kind of a fun playful aspect to it where that you'll see like a scene from the film and he'll be like yeah this was the actor so and so you know he did a great job you know good job and you know that kind of thing he's almost talking to the actors and kind of giving them praise inside the documentary and there's a really poignant part of the film where they cover the the dream sequence from the beginning when uh, Gunn is uh, imagining himself in this story that he's reading with a ramen master and this old actor played the ramen master and he died uh, the day after they finished shooting. Uh, he killed himself and you know Itami narrating on the documentary talks about how he feels really bad that he couldn't do something and but he says you know there was no way for us to tell that he was going through some dark stuff but I just feel like I I don't know maybe I could have done something. I know a lot of people feel that when they've been around someone who's killed themselves obviously. 
Uh, but he, the, you see all the behind the scenes footage of this old actor, this aging actor, kind of getting really self-conscious about remembering his lines. You see him in, in between takes kind of saying it over and over again, over and over again. And he's great in the film, you know? Uh, and they say that, you know, the only consolation we have is that he was very happy with what he did in the film on the drive home uh, on the last day. So there's that very uh, poignant part of it, but also it's a little bit eerie because I think he killed himself by jumping off a building. And the director himself, uh, just I think 10, 12 years after the making of Tan Popo, died by falling off a building under apparently suspicious circumstances. So th there's this weird edge to it when I think about that, having known what happened to the director after he made Tan Popo. Anyway, there, there are more light-hearted parts of the film. There's a great scene in the movie where uh, Goro flicks a, a piece of food onto um, a, a guy's face and it lands right in his nose. And you just see like the dozens of takes they do throwing this food at his face and it hits him in different spots and they're like oh no just just slightly more to the left and you, you just see them go over and over again all those little details are covered in the film the scene where the the man in the white suit is walking through the street the rain's pouring down he gets shot and you see the squibs popping off he was controlling those a little um, switch in his hand so he was controlling when the blood would spurt up uh, and when they rehearsed it they rigged it up so that lights would flash so they could time it perfectly the fight sequence, they show the fight sequence under the bridge and how they were choreographing it and one of the actors was like in his 30s and the guy who played Goro was in his uh, late 40s and you just see them knackered after doing a couple of takes but they didn't get a good take and so the director says I felt really bad here about asking them for another take because they were so exhausted. And, and you just see how much effort goes into moving the camera. A simple shot panning along the, the bar at the ramen uh, restaurant and you see all the characters eating, you know, it, it just feels so natural. The camera follows them as they're eating. And you see this big rig where there's like a, a track and a guy sitting on a little thing holding the camera and he's being pushed along by three people. Uh, and also they have like assistants underneath the camera pulling the lids off of the pots so that the steam rises up more. Because if you just had the pots open, the steam would kind of dissipate more. But if you pull the lid off just as the camera's going, that the steam comes up. So all those tiny details. And it just, it's a wonder of watching this film getting made. They, they even show the behind the scenes of the, uh, the infamous uh, egg yolk uh, exchange. <laughs> and I don't know if I liked seeing uh, a lot of the behind the scenes stuff of the, the actress as she's topless and having food smeared all over her and the actors licking it off her armpits and stuff. I don't think I needed to see that, you know. But it at least shows that they, you know, were, were kind of treating it as a, more of a, a laugh than anything else. And it kind of takes some of that weirdness out of it for me when I actually watched the film, knowing that they were really just cracking up about it behind the scenes and weren't taking it too seriously. But yeah, can you tell? I, I really liked this this making of. And oh, this might really rub some people the wrong way, but the one of the final scenes of the film when the gang are kind of marveling at the new ramen shop. The director talks about how he wanted to use classical music in this scene uh, and talks about how with films, you know, you get someone to score and to create music to match the scene and the movements of what's happening on screen. But he wanted to use some actual pre-existing classical music in this particular piece and so he had the task of fitting it to match the scene. And he literally plays the scene like four times for you. So th this sequence takes about 10, 12 minutes in the documentary. And he's like, yeah, let's, let's try it with this piece. And he's like, yeah, th this is working here. Yeah, oh, that matches, that matches what he's doing. This is really, oh, this is exquisite, you know. Oh, this, th this is it, you know. And then it gets to a point where the, the scene kind of comes down a bit, but the tempo of the song rises and he goes, ah, ah, no, no, we don't need that crescendo there. And he's like, how can we fix this? And so he tries a different way. And it just shows you, it's something I'm really intrigued with, is using music in filmmaking to enhance what's on screen. It gives things such a different flavor when you add music. It's such a, an important element of films if you decide to use it, that is. Silence can be great too, but music is so integral to evoking extra emotion or different emotion. You, know, you can kind of juxtapose music with you know, really heavy music with something really you know, happy or whatever. You know, you know the, the drill of kind of put in different music with different feeling scenes. Anyway, he kind of goes through the process of feeling out and finding the right place to start the music, where to lead it in, and how to make it work with this um, penultimate scene of the film. Well, I guess it's kind of the final sequence of the movie. And I found that absolutely fascinating, but I could see it dragging on a bit for some people because the film, the documentary is very kind of rapid fire. It goes to all these different scenes and then you really slow down at the end for that kind of stuff. And they go into like the dubbing, you know, the scene where... <laughs> The fucking the what was it the the Hoover scene 
where the old man gets the, the, the pork stuck in his throat and they stick the hoover down his throat. And he narrates over the doctor and say, well, we obviously didn't turn the hoover on, so we did that in post. And then you go into like the Foley studio and the directors there like, hmm, no, it needs to be like a, a sucking noise and then a pop. And they're like mixing food around and stuff and he's supervising everything. So you really get the sense that this guy is so involved in the making of this film. He's so in love with the idea of making this film. Even at the beginning, he was drawing caricatures of the characters for the movie poster before they even got started because he was so antsy to get started with this film. Right, I'm going to just draw the poster. You know, he was so excited about making this and it's so infectious to see this film to see someone who's so in love with making movies. And uh, he talks a bit about the ending, which kind of made me feel a little bit better about the ending as well, the way that he compares it to the Western and so on. Anyway, I could go on and on about this. There's so many great little details in this. And perhaps my favorite part was the very ending, where I really um, loved what he said about his ideology towards making films. Actually, before I get to that, there's also an interview on the Blu-ray with his wife uh, at the time, who talked about the film last year on its 30th anniversary, and she doesn't look like she's aged 30 years at all, as an aside. But um, she said that her husband had these three keys to making a film. Uh, one was to surprise the audience, one was for the film to be fun, and the other is for it to be easy to understand for the audience. In the end of the documentary, he says that what he always tells people about you know, him, him making films and the way that the films are received is that um, one can only make half of a film. The other half happens in the darkness of the theater and in the hearts of the audience. And I couldn't agree more. You know, y you can only do so much when you make a film. And it's all about that person who's sitting there watching it and what they bring to it as well. And that's the exciting part of it. And ah, I just loved it. You don't really get anything from the actors at all. They don't really, there's no interviews. It's all this kind of on-set footage and him narrating it. But having the director guide you through all these different steps of the process was so fascinating to me. And so even though it might not be as in-depth as something like the Lord of the Rings stuff or the Blade Runner documentary, uh, I feel like it, it, it's one of the best films just about filmmaking that I've ever seen. And even just looking at the way the sets were done inside the, the ramen shop of, of Tampopo, because at the end when everything's, you know, she, she sets it up and there's people coming in, you look outside, it looks like that's outside, you know, it looks like that is literally a street outside. The way that they lit it, put a bit of a, a bush there, it looks so real, but then you, you, you see the behind the scenes stuff, it's, it's just, it's just some walls, you know, some cardboard, well not cardboard, but you know, it's a flimsy kind of construction, but the way that they, you know, put it into the film, it creates this world. The scene when um, Goro and Tampapu are having some food, and there's that, that kind of beautiful backdrop outside of the, the river and the bridge with the train going past. They talk about how if they just filmed that scene, you wouldn't see anything in the background because it wasn't bright enough. So they put these huge kind of halogen lamps on the top of the building to light up that massive backdrop. And it doesn't seem like that in the film, but it's just done so subtly. And again, you look at like the... Uh, I'm just so excited about this. I loved it so much. But like the, the, the camera operators with their little lighting meters. Like a little scene when they're, they're hailing a cab in the rain. They've got to get the rain ready. They're waiting like for, for the, the sun to fall at the perfect light to capture everything. And they've got to get it in one take or, you know, in a couple of takes and so on. They've got the light meter there ready and waiting. They've got a guy there with a lamp to be the... The, the light of the taxi going past and they've got to get everything right on cue, the, the rain. It just really makes you appreciate what actually goes into making a film. I think people do take it for granted. Like, oh, we well, just get a camera there and you tell people to do this. So many moving parts and, they, and a lot of times you have to be so precise with everything. And one of my favorite vignettes was the uh, the old woman who goes into the shop and touches all the food. And they show the, uh, the kind of putting that scene together, getting the timing right. And they rehearse it, and the director's like, ah, oh, I wish we'd, be, we'd been filming that, that was perfect. And then they film it for real, and he's like, oh, that was even better, and he's like laughing about it. Oh my god, I can't believe I forgot this. One of the best things I've ever seen in a making of documentary, when the, the man in the white suit gets shot and killed, and he's lying on the floor, and you know, he's got the blood all over him and stuff, and they talk about how it was really cold uh, in that the season when they shot it, and you literally see him shivering in the rain, but as soon as they roll cameras, he kind of puts it aside and stuff, and the director says in the narration, like, his his willpower is astounding, or something like that. But there's this woman who, who like, a, a woman walks past the set, and she thinks that someone's been murdered. <laughs> She's ready to call the police, and they, they film her, and, and they're like, no, it's a film, he's fine. And she's like, oh, so he's, he's okay then? 
And the director says in the narration, he's like, she, she wasn't convinced. Like, look, he's breathing, he's talking, he's fine. We're just making a movie. And she, she, wa she walks off, but she's still doubtful. <laughs> Even though the guy is there going, yeah, I'm fine. She's still like, is, is he dead? <laughs> and the director's laughing like, we're going to get arrested. Like, it's such a random, like, it's a moment that wouldn't have been out of place in the film itself, but it happened in real life. And they were there to capture it with the camera. And I just, <laughs> it was one of the funniest things I've seen. Like, just a fly-on-the-wall moment of just a crazy on-set story. Like, it's one of those things you'd read on the trivia section of IMDb and think, that didn't really happen, did it? A woman didn't really think someone had been murdered and then still doubted it after they said, no, look, it's a film and he's still breathing and talking. And she's still like, well, okay then. <laughs> right, so that was my uber gushing about this, this making of film. And the film itself, you know, you can check my review of that out too. And yeah, and... It kind of, again, reconciled some of my problems with the film where I was a little bit uncomfortable with the kind of quote-unquote food porn sequences, I guess. Seeing them kind of film it behind the scenes and kind of laughing and stuff kind of takes some of the uncomfortable, you know, essence I, I had inside myself while watching those scenes. Anyway, I'll leave it there. <laughs> Definitely uh, a making off to what If you like the film, it's a no-brainer. If you like filmmaking and are interested in the process of that, it's a no-brainer. Couldn't recommend it enough. Fantastic making of one of the best I've ever seen. So thanks for watching. And if you've seen it, let me know. And if you haven't, thanks for watching. And I'll see you in the next one. Apart from the fact he throws cans and call it into a tree. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, it's really cool. But he's not quite as cool as you, because